Our next and final uh, speaker this afternoon um, is the right, the very reverend Dr. Graham Redding. Uh, he's an academic, but he's also uh, an ordained minister of word and sacrament in the Presbyterian Church. And so uh, for our array of speakers today, he represents uh, perhaps most strongly a servant of the church, the community which has developed largely and sustained uh, the Bible and is sustained by the Bible. And so uh, picking up the language uh, of John's Gospel of truth, Graham is going to come uh, and speak to us make sure I get the title right, of, of his talk, The King James Bible, A Study in Truth and Beauty. So please welcome Graham Redding. Thank you, Alistair. Uh, you talked about the almost reverential hush as Rob has been reading the scriptures today. One of, uh, before I begin my address, I do want to say that one of my uh, hobby horses is, uh, around the church is the fact that scripture is read so poorly in so many churches these days. The public reading of scripture has in many ways become a lost art and a lost discipline. But when it's read well, it's captivating and draws you in, uh, and, and, and I think there's a lot to be said for churches recovering a good reading of public, or public reading of scripture. I think the multiplicity of translations, while it's a, a beneficial thing in many respects, uh, also has a downside, because I think it's added to that confusion surrounding the reading of the word, certainly in public worship. And Robert, I love the way you've, you've mastered that jacket in English. I just want you to come and read my paper for me. <laughs> <laughs> In this paper, I will contend that one of the legacies of the King James Bible is that truth and beauty are deemed to matter, and they are related. The production of the King James Version of the Bible did not occur in a vacuum. From the time that John Wycliffe undertook the first complete English translation of the script Christian scriptures 200 years earlier, the Church in England had desired an authorised version that could be used for the public reading of scripture throughout the realm, thereby serving the goal of religious uniformity. The first authorised version was produced during the reign of King Henry VIII in 1539. The Great Bible, as it was known, relied heavily on William Tyndale's 1526 translation. The revised version, known as the Bishop's Bible, after its prime sponsor, the Archbishop of Canterbury, was given official approval in 1568. But at a popular level, it was the 1560 Geneva Bible, written by Protestant exiles living in Switzerland, that tended to hold sway, mainly because of, because of its availability in small editions at a relatively low cost. But it was distrusted by the powers that be because, it, because of its annotations which questioned the authority of monarchs and that they were deemed to be subversive. In 1601, when, ja when King James VI of Scotland attended the General <coughs> Assembly of Scotland, a proposal was put forward for a new translation of the Bible into English. Two years later, he acceded to the throne of England as King James I of England. In 1604, as we've already heard, the newly crowned king convened the Hampton Court Conference, at which it was proposed that a new English version be produced, in response to the perceived problems and inaccuracies in previous versions. It is thought that one of the reasons James wanted to authorise a new translation was to have a Bible that wouldn't have the contentious annotations. It was one thing for a Bible to be declared by a king and church as the authorised version, but for it to be received and used as such, it needed to be known to be accurate in its translation indeed more accurate than any version that preceded it, including the problematic but popular Geneva Bible. How to ensure such accuracy? Not by entrusting the task to one person, but rather by assigning the task to a group of reputable scholar clerics from the best educational institutions in the land and establishing a robust process of translation and review. To this end, towards the end of 1604, 
47 scholars from the universities of Oxford, Cambridge and Westminster, grouped into six committees, set about the task of translation. Using the Bishop's Bible as a starting point for their work, but working also with other versions and with the oldest Hebrew and Greek manuscripts available to them. Each committee was assigned a section of the Bible, including the Apocrypha. Draft translations by each committee were compared and revised for harmony with each other. Within four years, the initial translating work by the committees was done. Their work was reviewed by a general committee of review, and the Bible was ready to go to print in 1611. The whole process then took seven years and succeeded in achieving a high degree of scholarly consensus. All things considered, this was a fine achievement. That is not to say the process was without error, as Chris Marshall pointed out earlier, nor was it without flaw or bias. All the translators chosen for the task were members of the Church of England, and all but one were clergy. Instructions were given to them that, that, that were intended to limit Puritan and Popish influences on the translation and uphold the Episcopal structure of the Church of England and its beliefs about ordained clergy. This then was, in a sense, an establishment Bible authorised by the King and supportive of the State Church, the Church of England. In the preface to the King, the translators expressed with great eloquence their gratitude to and admiration for the king. Quote, great and manifold were the blessings which Almighty God, the Father of all mercies, bestowed upon us, the people of England, when he first sent your majesty's royal person to rule and reign over us. But amongst all the joys, there was no one that more filled our hearts than the blessed continuance of the preaching of God's sacred word among us, which is that inestimable treasure which excelleth all the riches of the earth. Above all else, the translators were concerned for, and I quote again, maintaining and propagating the truth of Christ, and to make God's holy truth to be yet more and more known unto the people. To the extent that the king was deemed to be the principal mover and author of this work, he was deemed to be nothing less than a sanctified person who, under God, is the immediate author of people's true happiness. Now, the point I want to make from these quotes from the preface is to say that the royal patronage enjoyed by the translators was regarded as a servant of truth, not as an act of political interference and institutional self-interest. As a study into the nature of knowledge and truth, the process by which the King James Bible came into being, I think, attests to several things. Firstly, academic inquiry and the quest for knowledge is a quest for a more complete understanding and articulation of truth. Truth matters. Precision matters. Secondly, that which is the object of academic inquiry, in a sense, discloses itself to us and over time helps us to refine the tools, the sources, and the direction of our inquiry. In this sense, knowledge, all knowledge, is provisional, incremental, and open-ended. We work with the best data and information we have at the time, knowing that we will not have the last word. And the King James translators never thought that they would have the final word in translation. They were doing the best that they could at the time with the tools at their disposal. The fact that we now have more accurate translations of the Bible based on even earlier manuscripts than were available to the King James translators does not detract in any way from the stature of the King James Version and the pivotal role that it played in the history of English translation. Third, the pursuit and accumulation of knowledge is a collaborative exercise. It involves a community of suitably qualified scholars committed to the same goal who make their work available for peer review. And fourthly, truth is to a certain extent a matter of perspective. Although the quest for knowledge demands objectivity, we inevitably bring to the task a cluster of assumptions, biases and perspectives. Vested interests, ulterior motives, political agendas and economic pressures 
may also be present. But an enduring piece of work will, in a sense, be judged by history to have transcended these sorts of parameters and limitations. The King James Version is one such piece of work. That which was authorised by way of royal decree came within a generation or two to be regarded as authoritative both within and without the Church of England. Now the points here I've made about truth I would say are still applicable and if you think of the current issue of climate change, for example, and the debate around climate change, you've got the emerging data that's carefully collated. Of course scientists bring to that to that whole area of research, some presuppositions and some theories, but as they submit their theories to the data, gradually their theories are refined and they build on the work that's gone before and over time a consensus emerges and it's open for peer review. Of course there will always be sceptics, those that doubt, but by and large the scientific community as a whole moves forward incrementally as long as they, as long as they submit to certain due process and checks and balances which I think are there. And I see a strong parallel between what existed back in the 17th century with the King James Bible in a more, shall we say, primitive form, but nevertheless the same principles were in operation. The literary merits and legacy of the King James Bible are widely acknowledged. From 1611 until the middle of the 20th century, the King James Bible came to be the dominant, shareable, cultural norm for most writers and readers of English. Writers with a religious purpose, such as Milton and Bunyan, used it, but it was also a major source for non-religious writers, such as Byron, whose Hebrew melodies drew heavily on the Old Testament. Knowledge of the Bible was also important for women writers and novelists like Charlotte Bronte, who did not generally have access to the Greek and Latin classics in which upper-class men were educated. Writing in the Otago Daily Times this week, John Hale said that in his Dictionary of Quotations, there are 30 pages of phrases or verses from the King James Version. As well as aiming for accuracy, <clears throat> the translators wanted to produce a Bible that would be appropriate, dignified and resonant in public reading. In a period of rapid linguistic change, the translators avoided contemporary idioms tending instead towards forms that in some sense were already archaic like verily, and it came to pass, and I was interested to hear the discussion this morning, that part of that may have been to do with the age of the translators reflecting their generation of thought, but they weren't wanting to innovate with the language. The end result was a model in linguistic elegance, although as Alistair McGrath observes, and it's been pointed out today, this was not the primary aim. The translators, McGrath says, did not set out to produce an enduring cultural artefact a religious museum piece, or a finely wrought work of art. Their concern was to provide an accurate translation of the Bible, on the assumption that accuracy was itself the most aesthetic of qualities to be desired. <coughs> Indeed, in the preface to the King, the translators took the opportunity to express their primary aim of illuminating the meaning of Scripture. And I quote, Translation it is that openeth the window to let in the light, that breaketh the shell that we may eat the kernel, that putteth aside the curtain that we may look into the most holy place, that removeth the cover of the well that we may come by the water. Aiming at truth, McGrath says, the translators achieved what later generations recognised as beauty and elegance. And while such beauty and elegance are widely applauded, we do need to ask if there is a downside. Biblical scholar N.T. Wright suggests there is. With translations, he says, there are at least two sorts of accuracy. The first sort of accuracy is the technical accuracy of making sure that every possible nuance of every word, phrase, sentence and paragraph has been rendered accurately into the new language. But there is a second sort of accuracy, perhaps deeper than this, the accuracy of flavour and feel. It is possible in translation as in life, says Wright, to gain the whole world and to lose your own soul, to render everything with a wooden, clunky, lifeless accuracy from which the one thing that really matters has somehow escaped 
producing a gilded cage from which the precious bird has flown. Granted the impossibility of the strictest kind of accuracy, it is important from time to time to go for the accuracy of flavour and feel. The whole point of the New Testament, after all, is that it is one of the most dramatic, subversive and life-giving collections of writings ever assembled. Lose that and you've lost the plot. The question is, did that happen with the King James Version? Did its literary elegance and beauty subdue or domesticate the Bible's revolutionary message? Wright says yes, he believes it has in places. The King James Bible, he says, is grand, splendid, magisterial. It strides down the road with measured tread, never in a hurry, looking to right and left and bowing to passers-by. Its cadences roll off the tongue and ring around the rafters, especially when helped on their way by the ample acoustics of an ancient parish church or cathedral. The problem is, though, he points out, most of the New Testament isn't like that. Take Mark's Gospel, for example, which has a real sense of urgency about it. It reads as though it was dictated at speed, albeit from a well-stored and much-rehearsed corporate and individual memory. It is more like a scruffy revolutionary tract than a polished leather-bound treatise. And then there's the Apostle Paul. Wright says, was anything less measured, less grand and magisterial than the letter to the Galatians? Is anything in the New Testament less polished, more jerky and disjointed, torn between anguish and irony, than the second letter to the Corinthians? For the most part, Wright continues, Paul's letters are just that, letters, usually in a hurry, often anxious, frequently glancing over the shoulder, at the next wave of pagan attack or unjust criticism. Paul could outthink most philosophers, let us be in no doubt. But it would falsify his letters to dress them up as polished philosophical tracts. It is therefore imperative, Wright continues, to allow the New Testament to speak with different tones of voice, aiming often for street-level English, rather than the somewhat donish tradition of the King James Bible, and even subsequent translations like the Revised Standard Version and the New Revised Standard Version. Now I think if Wright is right, then perhaps that explains something of the popularity of contemporary translations and paraphrases of the Bible today. One of the most popular in churches at the moment is Eugene Peterson's, Eugene Peterson's The Message. It's not even a translation, but it's proving hugely popular. Why is that? Well, let me illustrate the point by comparing two versions of the same Bible passage, Mark 7, 5 to 9. First of all, from the King James Bible, and then from uh, the message. And in this passage, it's a testy exchange. Jesus is rebuking the Pharisees and the scribes. So first of all, from the King James Version. I should get you to read this, Robert. Then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, why walk not thy disciples according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashen hands? He answered and said unto them, Well hath Esaias prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honoureth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, Ye behold the tradition of men, as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. And now from the message. The Pharisees and religion scholars asked, why do your disciples flout the rules, showing up at meals without washing their hands? Jesus answered, Isaiah was right about frauds like you. Hit the bullseye, in fact. <coughs> These people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their heart isn't in it. They act like they are worshipping me, but they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover for teaching whatever suits their fancy, 
ditching God's command and taking up the latest fads. He went on, well, good for you. You get rid of God's command so you won't be inconvenienced in following the religious fashions. Which is more accurate? Which is truer? <coughs> if accuracy and truth are measured just in terms of the directness of translation, then we would have to opt for the King James Version. But if accuracy and truth are also measured in terms of flavour and feel, then I think the message must get the nod in this passage. For it better captures the mood of this testy exchange between Jesus and the Pharisees and scribes. The freshness of its language trumps the eloquence of the King James Version. So how to sum this up? As a study on truth and beauty, the King James Bible leads me to make four tentative conclusions. First of all, <clears throat> a commitment to truth involves not only the acquisition of knowledge about something, but also a form of existential engagement with the object of inquiry, a willingness to hear what it says to us on its own terms, to let it speak as it were, to enter a process of question and counter-question through which deeper understanding and personal reflection emerges. Truth is not only that which we grasp, it is something that confronts us. This is especially so in relation to sacred or religious texts because of their particular mode of witness and interpretation of reality. Secondly, accuracy is an essential attribute in these processes. Third, accuracy is both a technical property and an aesthetic quality. Or to put it another way, there are at least two forms of accuracy. Technical accuracy and contextual accuracy, or accuracy of flavour and feel. And fourth, <coughs> it is possible for a piece of work to be described as eloquent or beautiful in a timeless sort of way, and for it to possess a certain technical accuracy. But if it lacks an accuracy of flavour and feel, then the truth of the work risks being subverted by the very aesthetic qualities for which it is admired. So the question is, has this occurred with the King James Bible? Do the aesthetic qualities <coughs> and cultural legacy for which it is rightly admired tame and domesticate its revolutionary message? Is the King James Bible more of a cultural artefact or a living word? <clears throat> well, one clear answer to these questions, I think, is found in the fact that the vast majority of churches and Christian believers around the world do prefer other versions in both the public reading of Scripture and personal devotions. While it is indeed right to honour the King James Version and the mark that it made in the history of English translation, and while it is indeed right to mark its cultural legacy and what it spawned and what it influenced and shaped, I do hope too that such honouring encourages conversations about the ongoing role and function of sacred scripture in and for today's world, not least of which here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And so I was pleased to see Andrew Bradstock's paper included in the lineup of papers, that it's, it's not just honouring the King James Bible, but how does the Bible function? as the Word of God in the public domain in Aotearoa, New Zealand today. And I hope that this conference sparks those sorts of conversations as we honour our forebears and the legacy that we've inherited. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham, for finishing so, uh, in such a considerate manner to allow time for questions. So, um, Graeme, you're happy to take questions? Would you put a best before date on the King James Bible? <laughs> <laughs> and what would it be? I don't know that I would put a best before date on. I, I think the, um, the King James Bible is still appropriate in many settings. Uh, it, the fact that there are other translation hasn't rendered it obsolete by any means. But as others have said, I think we also have to acknowledge the role that other versions can play. And uh, in parish ministry, uh, I, and as what I say to our students in Dunedin, you need several versions at your disposal, of which one should be the King James Version. But it was sort of on its own right up until 
Well, the early 1900s, I guess. Right? Yes. Yeah. Do you think that you need to be um, a wary then of some of the new translations that perhaps haven't um, gone under the microscope that the King James did as, as far as scholars Yes, I, I, I think there are translations and there are translations and there are, pra there are paraphrases as well. For example, uh, about 20 years ago, the one that was in, well, you had the Good News and you had the Living Bible. Uh, and both, well, the Living Bible was a pure paraphrase. The Good News was part translation, or tra an attempted contemporary translation, but a very poor translation. Uh, and, and it actually changed some of the, some of the theological terms quite dramatically. Uh, so I think there are some very weak and poor translations that, and paraphrases that are better avoided. But I think there are some very good modern translations. I think the, the NIV, the, the NRSV... Uh, and one of the marks is, I talked about the community of scholarship, where there are uh, a, a, a communities of scholarship behind particular translations, and I think one of the strengths of the NRSV, it utilised uh, Jewish scholars as well for the Hebrew scriptures, uh, but also it was ecumenical in, in its flavour. It gave a measure of confidence about the breadth and depth of the translation. Uh, but again, there is, I think one of the things that's emerging from today's discussion, there is no one perfect translation. And we need, you know, I think, places like the message, which isn't a translation, but it catches so well the flavour of things. And while I wouldn't advocate the message for public reading of Scripture, I think in terms of, the, in terms of how it might supplement a sermon or how it might be used more in a home group or, or more informal setting, I think it's got a lot going for it. Peter? Graham, isn't your comparison a little bit unfair? Because, I mean, obviously they're not written in the same generation, so we're not comparing like with like. And, I mean, when wouldn't your comparison be fairer if you compared the King James Version with the revised version of 1881, which you might recall, though a great scholarly achievement, was a, an utter flop in terms of public reading, mm -hmm. precisely for the reasons that you laid down, the kind of technical. And may not the difference really be that the King James Version was very aware of the public reading aspect of it. Uh, which is exactly where the message falls down, because when you hear it read in church, it loses much of the intimate quality that it has so effectively in personal reading. Mm. I'm not quite clear I've been unfair in that. So. Well, I thought you were, you were saying that the King James Version failed because it was a bit too technical. and that it, it, it No, I'm not saying it failed in its day, but I'm saying that in terms of... Um, Certainly, I think when you compare it with more modern translations and paraphrases, the, the, a lot of contemporary writers are concerned to get that, that more uh, contextual feel for the But text. in which case, the fairer comparison might be, say, the New English Bible, yes. which did fail yes. quite significantly compared yes. to some other translations. Yes. But also, what we're seeing is that language changes over time. Yes. So, in, in, in its day, even though it had some archaic phrases and terms of phrase, nevertheless it did emerge within a relatively short space of time. It, it developed an ownership of the people as it were, it wasn't just by royal decree as such. Uh, so it did work at that level. When English was, you know, that was still recognised as such, it's, there's more of a gap I think with the contemporary situation. Yes. Uh, you started by saying that the public reading of scriptures is something we don't have enough of these days. Which Bible would you choose for that? Uh, well, the one that, that uh, we tend to recommend, at least in, in our tradition, is the New Revised Standard Version. But that, um, but that also has its faults, but that tends to be the one. I think. Uh, in, in the evangelical tradition of the church, I think they probably still favour more the NIV, the New International Version. But, uh, Frank, I'd be interested to know what... NRSV. NRSV. Are, are other traditions represented the new, here? The New Living Bible is a remarkable. Talk about that. Talk about that, Peter. What what makes it remarkable? I'm not I'm, I'm not because familiar it, with the New. It's living. moved away from the completely paraphrastic notion of the Old Living Bible mm. and some of those, and it has managed to combine the other public reading with a, a more intimate language. Mm. It, it's quite an interesting translation to look at. 
Is that widely, which, if you had to categorise which segments the church would use oh, that? Oh, it's within the evangelical segments, but it's, mm. it, it comes across very effectively in public reading. Mm. What? Well, mm. I'd like to know what you think about the, one of the Bibles we haven't mentioned, the Jerusalem Bible, which I know some Protestant ministers use by preference these yes. days. Mm. Uh, well, on a personal level, I think it's a very good, it's a very good Bible to be able to use. I'm not... I'm not deeply knowledgeable of its background and how it came into being, so I can't comment on the history of, of, of the scholarship behind it. But again, it would be a very reputable translation. Tonkey was the literary advisor. Was he? Mm. Have, have, in asking that, Ian, have you got a particular viewpoint on the Jerusalem Bible? No, no, I, I just, I'm drawn to it. Mm. But um, I just wonder where, where it stood in the spectrum. Catholic. Mm. It's, it's the Roman yeah, well, it's, it's a Roman Catholic, Catholic Bible. scholarship. Yes, but I don't think the denominational um, suspicions are quite as entrenched as they would have been a generation or two ago in relation to that. Graham, uh, can, can you comment? Oh, sorry. So Frank, and then just, um, just comment on the New King James Bible, yes. which is, is around. I'm not, I'm not familiar with it. Do you, what, can you, does anyone know about the New King James Version? And well, it's it's do you know anything about the New King James Version? Um, I don't know if it's published, it really isn't King James any more than any of the other ones in the King James tradition. Mm. Uh, it again was done by a pretty wide group of scholars, it tends to use King James language, it tends to be a bit of a paraphrase along with it, and it seems to have gone out of fashion. Mm. But it, it uses, it's invented in a way, a textus receptus as a kind of formal Greek background for translation purposes, so it's from what I would call a very suspect Greek text. Okay. I was a little surprised what you said about New English Bible, because about 20 years ago um, I had my daughter in English high school mm. in England, and that school said it has to be New English Bible. And then when we transferred to New York, to Anglican Church. That was also, we have to use just one Bible because it is hard best. When, when it is read in the service, people, you know, receive best of all the Bibles. That's mm. why I was, I was using all the time before mm. I came to this country. Mm. And in New Zealand, have you found it used much at all? No, not at all. So mm. that's why I was... Hey, did you know why that would be? The Frank may not be. Yeah, Frank? Or, yeah. Well, I, the, the New English Bible, 1961, was the New Testament, and it was seen as a, a British alternative to the Revised Standard Version of 1953. And then the whole Bible came in 1970, if I remember right. The problems immediately was that Dodd's, C.H. Dodd, as the as the linguistic advisor had kind had rather seriously affected some of the ways in which Old Testament passages were rendered, mm. so there was quite a lot of criticism of the some of the translation, um, especially the Psalms, for example, and the prophets, uh, and there was it also felt that some of its language is rather elegant. It 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 aimed for a rather superior language, and I think it fell flat. The revised, it, it was revised, and the uh, revised English Bible, I use a bit myself, mm. but it, my copy is stamped with the word damaged over the frontispiece, which is the sign that the Oxford Cambridge production that produced it flopped, and they reminded them, but didn't care to admit they reminded <laughs> it, so they, they got rid of enormous piles of so-called damaged copies. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe our last question. Yes. Um, I liked your comparison of uh, um, Mark's, the translations of Mark's Gospel, where it seems to me that the original writing might not have been very well written. Uh, would you favour a translation which translated a bad original into a bad translation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it can, if you're talking about public reading of scripture, 
it, it, is a, it is a difficult... On the one hand, as I said, accuracy is important. It is important. And when we're reading Scripture, the accuracy does count. But to have that accuracy of flavour, not just the technical accuracy, is also important for the public reading of Scripture. So it, it, the reading of Scripture should be something... It should be the centre point of the service of worship in, in many respects. Uh, so... In some ways, I'm wanting to avoid answering kind of yes or no to your question. I'm wanting a sort of a both end. I'm wanting enough technical accuracy to, that, that, that would stand scrutiny. But I'm also wanting that accuracy of flavour and feel so that, so that it doesn't just become a mechanical exercise of reading what the scriptures say, but it's speaking to people's hearts. And you're not just relying on the sermon to somehow do everything. It is... In some ways, the sermon serves the scriptures, not the other way around. Uh, and so the, the public reading of scriptures should be a significant event in and of itself. So I'd say I would still want both end, if possible. So you're commissioning a new translation. <laughs> <laughs> We've got the committee. That's right. So we'll meet again tomorrow and begin work. Um, look, thank you, Graham. I, I, I neglected to say that, because uh, Graham sort of feels like very much part of the Wellington scene, but he's not. He uh, lives in, in Dunedin. And so we're very grateful to you for coming up uh, and uh, joining in today and contributing um, with your with your talk to us. So um, also, I'm not sure what I'm not sure what version this is. It could be um, it could be very interesting when the wrapper comes off uh, to see what it is. But uh, let's show our appreciation for. Uh, <laughs>